Good evening. My name is Tom Michaud, a Foreign Policy Association board member, and welcome to the Peter G. Peterson Distinguished Lecture on National Security and Fiscal Policy. The Peter G. Peterson Foundation was established to increase awareness of America's long-term fiscal challenges. A recipient of the Foreign Policy Association Medal, Pete Peterson was a former Secretary of Commerce and co-founder of Blackstone. The inaugural Peter Peterson Distinguished Lecture on National Security and Fiscal Responsibility was delivered by former Treasury Secretary Paul O'Neill in 2016. Last year's lecture was delivered by Professor John Taylor, Stanford University, the, former, the author of my former college textbook in economics. I'm delighted to welcome and introduce our guest speaker this evening. Philip Swaggle is the director of the Congressional Budget Office and is currently in one of the most important positions in Washington with regard to measuring and advising on our nation's fiscal policy. The Congressional, Bu Congressional Budget Office is a nonpartisan body created by Congress with the mission of being the honest broker when it comes to measuring and assessing the impact of fiscal policy and budget decisions. While preparing for tonight's lecture, I did some homework and saw that Philip's career has been based upon nonpartisan research and service. He has a long and distinguished career in public service and academia. He has served as economist for the Federal Reserve Board of Governors, the White House Council of Economic Advisors, and as Assistant Secretary of the Treasury for Economic Policy, where he helped direct the nation's response to the global financial crisis. Phil graduated with a major in economics from Princeton University and went on to earn a PhD from Harvard University. He has also taught economics at Northwestern University. We couldn't be more delighted to have him with us this evening. We're at a critical moment in our nation's history with regards to fiscal policy, especially with regards to national security. And please join me in welcoming Director Philip Swaggle. Thank you, Tom. Thank you so much. And Noel, thank you for uh, inviting me. Um, and, and thanks to the, the Peterson Foundation and um, it was really a, a pleasure and an honor to speak at a, a lecture in honor of Pete Peterson, um, who, of course, as, uh, as we just heard, had a distinguished career and did so much to foster discussion of the long-term fiscal issues facing the nation. Um, uh, so I, and I will come back to that. I will come back to fiscal sustainability and the long-term fiscal issues uh, at, at the end. Um, so my background, you heard a little bit about it. Um, we can Afterwards, we can gather and, and talk about the TARP, um, the, 13th anniversary of the TARP, right, just, uh, just, just passed, um, which obviously I worked on uh, in a previous, uh, you know, previous time in government. Um, I've been at the CBO since June of 2019, and so the CBO director is chosen jointly by the House and the Senate. So I was chosen by the Senate, which is then under Republican control, and accepted, in a sense, by the House, and, and uh, appointed uh, jointly by the two, um, by the two chambers. Um, and it's a four-year term, so it's a fixed four-year term through the end of the 117th Congress, um, so through January 2023. Now, CBO is best known, it was sort of in the news for cost estimates, you know, there's legislation, how much does it cost, and, and so on. Um, and of course, that is our bread and butter. We do a lot of other things, including technical assistance. And so, especially with complicated legislation, we, you know, our analysts will be working with the, the Congress, you know, generally with the staff of the, the committees developing the legislation and going back and forth um, uh, as they decide what to do. And this is the, the, the key thing about CBO is that Congress gets our analysis, but they don't get our opinion. And this is put in at the very beginning, so 46 years ago by Alice Rivlin, the founder of the agency, um, you know, she, she said, you know, for the, the budget agency to work, it has to be nonpartisan, and it has to be so nonpartisan that it doesn't have opinions. It just doesn't, you know, so I, I try to avoid normative language um, uh, as much as possible, and just, just provide analysis. Um, uh, now, of course, you know, providing analysis can take, you know, can, you know, kind of go into detail. I'll, I'll go into, you know, go into depth, and I'll go into detail about a few of the um, things that we did during the pandemic. So that, that's what I'm, 
my intent uh, here to do is to talk maybe 25 minutes or so about some of the work we did the, during the pandemic and try to distill some lessons from that. Now, I mean, the pandemic still, well, I guess looking at the room, we're, we're, it feels like we're getting out of it. But the economic response is still, is still with us. So it's probably too early to you know, draw the, the long lessons and the sort of deep lessons of the pandemic. And I'll come back to that at the end about some of the questions we are still trying to figure out um, uh, you know, for, for what's going to happen to the economy in the future. Um, but I'll talk about some of our work during the pandemic and then try to, to go at the end and, and, and draw some lessons. Okay. So um, you know, look, if you want to know about the legislation enacted during the pandemic, CBO.gov is the place to go. Um, you know, we have a cost estimate of every piece of legislation. There were um, five main bills responding to, responding to the pandemic in 2020, um, and those came to a total of $3.3 trillion. Um, uh, so that was in 2020, and then in March 2021, there's the American Rescue Plan Act. Um, that was, we, we scored that at $1.9 trillion. So, um, uh, there's a lot, anyway, there's a lot of money, even, even um, by, by DC terms, and we've worked on all, um, on all of that during the, um, during the crisis, of course, during the pandemic. Um, behind the scenes, we're working on all the details. So as the, um, you know, so the CARES Act, which is the, large, the first of the large bills last March, was enacted, we were working with staff as they, did, as they were trying to figure out, well, how to support the economy and how to support families um, during the pandemic. So you think of the, when the economy shut down last March, and obviously I realized you know, it hit the hardest initially here in, um, you know, here in New York, um, right, policymakers faced a dilemma that the US, you know, our, our social safety net wasn't set up in some sense to be, um, you know, to be as broad as policymakers wanted. Um, and so we worked very closely with policymakers as they examined options. And, and we saw one of the options that, that uh, policymakers enacted was an expansion of unemployment insurance. Right, it's both made you know, um, larger, so the $600 per week uh, bonus attached to it, and then broader with the extension to um, uh, part-time workers and gig workers and so on. Um, uh, and when I say the poor woman who's a, a star analyst who, who covers UI, and I think she must have done a thousand different cost estimates trying to decide, you know, trying to support the Congress. Um, when the Paycheck Protection Program was being considered, you know, the sort of analysis that we would do, or the, the technical assistance we would do, would be to help members of Congress and their staff understand, well, what is the size of the problem, right? If the Congress wanted to provide support for businesses and they settled on 500 employees or less, well, what is the payroll of all the businesses in the country that have 500 workers or less? It's actually really difficult to know. The data are, um, you know, are, are old. Um, uh, and so that, anyway, you, you can go on. That's the sort of thing that, uh, um, that we, we try to uh, do analysis on. Um, uh, if you look on the CBO website, and I, I don't have slides, so I'm not going to you know, point to numbers. If you look on the CBO website, some of the analysis that we did last year during the, um, you know, in the midst of the pandemic, is actually after the first set of, um, of, of responses, so the, the three initial bills in March, and then the one in April after the, um, the PPP, the Payment Check Protection Program, ran out, um, and there's an extension that, that added more money to that. Essentially, we analyzed the different policies that were enacted. Um, I mentioned two. I mentioned UI, unemployment insurance. I mentioned the Paycheck Protection Program. There's a variety of healthcare programs. There's money for state and local governments, and so on. So, you know, this, or if you spend $3.3 trillion, a lot can go into that. And we, we essentially looked at the main components of the response, and so what's the bang for the buck? Right, so here's how many dollars were, um, uh, you know, were, were, were devoted to this activity, and we said, okay, what's the GDP impact? And then, of course, you can, you know, just simple division gives you the bang for the buck. Right? So the, for a federal outlay, how much GDP um, uh, uh, came out of that? And you can rank it. And so we, you know, in our evaluation, at early in the pandemic, the unemployment insurance had a very high bang, uh, bang for the buck. And the idea is that early in the pandemic, the negative incentive effects of extending unemployment insurance were probably pretty modest, right? The economy was shut down, and, right? People were staying home, right? It wasn't that UI was keeping people at home, it was the, the virus keep, keeping people at home, the, the lockdowns. Um, so that had a very, a very high bang for the buck. The state and local uh, assistance had a high bang for the buck. And then other things, so the Paycheck Protection Program had a relatively low bang for the buck. Now, it's tempting to say, okay, the CBO likes 
this, these policies and not those policies, and that's absolutely not the case. Right? And this is, again, going back to Alice Rivlin, that's not what we do. So, so you can imagine policymakers saying, we policymakers, members of Congress, and the, the, the White House, the President, um, even if a program like the Paycheck Protection Program has a relatively low bang for the buck, I think it was like 36 cents on the dollar, essentially something like that, there's a sense which it fills a gap that these other programs don't get to. Right? A sort of small business community, um, nonprofits, at least in DC, in the DC area, essentially every nonprofit, including um, you know, churches, synagogues, um, others, received support from the PPP, and it's probably pretty critical. So that's, you know, again, it's, it's to say what the fiscal impact is and what the economic impact, that's an input into the policy making process. That's, that's the, the wind up here, but it is not the answer. And so we, that is part of our mission, is to provide the analysis. But that is just one component of it. So policymakers can say, look, this activity or this program, it might not have the most efficient bang for the buck, but it's a broad, you know, the aperture of it is quite wide, and that's what we want to do. And that's, you know, such as that's not for us, that's for our elected officials. Um, uh, so that's one. Uh, similarly, we did analysis of unemployment insurance, um, and, and, and this is still a, obviously a topic of, um, you know, of public debate. Uh, is saying, as, as I mentioned before, that early in the pandemic, the extension of unemployment insurance probably had pretty modest negative supply side effects. Right? And people are not choosing to, choosing to stay home because of the unemployment insurance. They're choosing to stay home because everything was, was locked down. And there's lots of academic research finding the same thing. At the same time, our projection was that as the economy reopened, so into the second half of 2020 and into 2021, we said that these negative Supply side incentives, you know, the sort of the uh, incentives of unemployment insurance, keeping people out of the labor in the labor market but out of work, um, uh, would become more salient, and that that looks to have been the case. Now, obviously, you know, since the summer with the resurgence of the virus and the variants and all, and all that, probably has kept people out of um, uh, out of work as well, and what's happening with schools and all that. So, um, so we don't know the answer. It's still an ongoing debate, but I, I mention it. So this, this is my first lesson, that early in the pandemic, the focus of policymakers, as you'd expect, was in res responding as quickly and as broadly as possible to the, the shutdown of the economy and the collapse of incomes, right? the, the loss of jobs, the loss of health insurance, and um, uh, the loss of incomes. And so this is that I think that the policies that resulted fit that. Right? They're very wide, there's not, you know, sort of, Less concern, obviously, about deficits and about debt. Of course, I'll come back to that. So less about deficits, less about debt, less about incentives, less focus on incentives, less focus on targeting and efficiency, you know, efficiency of policy. There's a sort of figure out how to get money out the door and get it out the door. And, you know, to the credit of the people in the executive branch in 2020 who were working on this, they, the money went out the door, right? The Treasury Department um, and the Internal Revenue Service uh, sent out checks in 2020 and again in 2021. Um, uh, you know, uh, not, not perfectly, of course, but um, you know, I, I think they worked. It's fair to say they worked wonders. The same thing with the Paycheck Protection Program, right? The um, Small Business Administration is a very small agency, and I don't think anyone expected them to be able to turn up, to stand up the PPP as quickly as they did and, um, and, and do as much as, as they did. So they, as as they deserve a lot of credit for that, you know, even though in our calculation, it maybe did not have the largest bang for the buck. Um, uh, so that's the beginning of the pandemic. Now, what's the situation today? That's what I'll come to. Okay, so that's sort of, that was then, at the end, I'll, I'll come back to what, what's, uh, what's going on now. Um, okay, let me, I, I don't wanna go on too long, but let me touch on a couple of more aspects of our, um, uh, of our work during the pandemic. And again, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to focus on things where I can draw lessons out of uh, for later. Um, so as you'd expect, the policy response to the pandemic was heavily focused on healthcare and health policy. Right? It's just natural given the, the nature of this economic crisis and downturn. Um, the, second, uh, the, the second bill that was enacted had a waiver in Medicare, um, which is gonna, it's gonna sound actually silly, it's, Almost silly now. Right? My phone's over there, but right today, if one of us, any of us, want to see a doctor, we pick up our phone and you know we push a few buttons and you know we see a you know whatever we see a health professional. Um, before the pandemic, 
for Medicare beneficiaries to use telehealth, they actually had to go to a telehealth center. Right, which it just sounds preposterous, but that was before the pandemic. So the second bill um, waived that. Um, and, and how long did it wait for? Well, for the duration of the public health emergency. So the public health emergency was declared on January 30th of last year, right? so before the economy shut down. Um, you know, then the president declared a public health emergency. And this waiver was for however long the public health emergency lasted. Okay. So from the CEO perspective, well, we have to figure out how much that costs, right? So it's an open check for as long as the, the PHE, sorry, from DC, I have to use the acronyms, um, the PHE lasts. Um, so anyway, I don't know, try to think, last March, right, when New York was shut down, did anyone have any idea how long the emergency would last? Now, I looked it up. Moderna delivered its vaccine to NIH uh, in Bethesda, near where we live, on February 24th. Right? But no one had any idea it would be so effective or, you know, so the distribution effort would be so remarkable. Right now we're about to get, you know, people are about to get third doses. Um, and so we had no idea. So we, what we had to, you know, to have a number for the Congress, we had to have a, we had to have a number. How long would the public health emergency last? And so within the CBO we had a, a team that contacted researchers around the world. It turns out the um, U.S. The, the, the U.S. government's national laboratory in Sandia, New Mexico, has a group that does computational epidemiology, which I have to admit, before last March, I didn't know was a thing. Um, and um, uh, so they, you know, they they have a, you know model capability, um, you know, provided an input, and, and you can go on. The people at the University of Washington who have done a lot of this work and, and others, and it's just we had to sit through that and say, well, what's our um, what's our estimate? So our estimate at the time was that the public health emergency would last through July of 2022. Right, so that's uh, the middle of next year. And the team said, so this was last April, they projected that the total number of fatalities in the US would be 500,000 through the end of 2021. Um, which of course, I was shocked, so I don't know about anyone else, but you expected last April. I was shocked by that um, by that number, and then, of course, for, if you think about it from the CBO perspective, we had to say, okay, not how many, not only how many deaths there'd be, but how many people would be in the hospital, of the people in the hospital, how many in the ICU, because all of this flows back to the federal balance sheet, right? There's a, a you know, the federal government covered a lot of costs, um, you know, for hospitals. Um, the federal government, um, you know, increased the support for Medicaid, so that was also in the, the second um, bill. Um, the federal government increased the, the share of Medicaid costs the federal government picked up, uh, supporting the states, uh, and other things. And just in normal times, the federal government is on the hook for much of um, a good part of health care, right? I mean, most people probably have you know, health care either through your employer or spouse's employer um, or, or med Medicare, and those are all either you know, largely covered by the federal government or there's a tax subsidy involved for employer insurance. And you can go on, right? I mean, federal employees, armed services, members, their families, children, there's a children's health insurance program, the Affordable Care Act, the exchanges, anyway, you can go on. There's all these different ways in which healthcare costs find their way onto the federal balance sheet. And we, we have to say, what's the direct effect of the pandemic? And then, what's the indirect effect, right? So if, so just 10 years from now, what will the pandemic do to healthcare costs? Right? I think we all, we all know, probably many of us, well, myself included, delayed healthcare early in the pandemic, well, what would that mean, right? Was it lots of wasted care that the federal government would save lots of money as a result? Or would people get sicker and, you know, then healthcare costs would go up in the future? Um, and so we had to view, view on all of this because that went into the, um, uh, the cost estimates. Um, so this is, I know, so I'll go back to the 500,000 number, which shocked me. And actually, it, it turns out, right, I know the number was just 700,000. If we just reached the 700,000 deaths, it's incredibly sad. But the last 200,000 were after the vaccine, after vaccines were you know, essentially widely available. So and, you know, it's not like those 200,000 people chose, you know, chose not to, you know, not to survive, of course. But in some sense, they're you know, obviously preventable. Um, there many of them, sadly, were preventable. Um, so, so that was some of our work it, it, during the pandemic, was trying to figure out the, um, you know, what was happening on the, on the healthcare side. Um, 
and so on. And so I, I talked about some of the, um, you know, some of the cost estimates that, that resulted. You can imagine other things. So as you're trying to think about what's the effect of the virus on the macroeconomy, you know, that feeds into spending, into um, you know, various parts of the federal spending, you know, unemployment insurance I've talked about before, food stamps, now called SNAP benefits, rise when the economy is weak. So we say, well, what would happen to the economy? Um, and then healthcare costs. Those are two major parts of our, um, our work stream supporting the Congress uh, during, the, during the pandemic. Um, let, me, let, me, let me now talk again. I, I don't want to go on much longer uh, to have time for, for questions and discussion, but let me talk about some of the work we're doing now and some of the issues we're working on, we're thinking about now, and then you know, kind of look ahead. That's, uh, that's sort of where I want to go next. Um, so I mentioned before that at the beginning of the pandemic, policymakers were much less focused on issues of supply, the incentives and supply. And the unemployment insurance was one I pointed to. And I think it's fair to say it's the opposite now. You know, my guess is that you know, businesses, you know, the businesses in New York are facing the same, you know, same issues that others around the country are in trying to hire and um, you know, get people to come back to the office and, uh, and, and recruit. Um, and so that is something we are focused on now. And so that um, President Biden has proposed a series of policies aimed at this. So subsidies for childcare, subsidies for home and community-based services, think of that as elder care for, um, you know, for other things. And so one of the, the tasks in front of us, well, the, one task is to wait for legislation, right? So when the Congress comes forward with legislation, we will analyze it and, and um, you know, sort of say, here's the cost estimate, here's the, the details. Part of our job at CBO is in some sense to look ahead and say, where is the Congress going? And try to get there first with our analysis. So childcare subsidies, you can imagine the different, um, I'm sorry, I'm gonna shift into economics professor mode for a second here, right? This is labor supply versus labor demand, right? So if, if um, the policy is um, essentially a, a subsidy for childcare costs, it will limit you know, how much out of your income you have to pay in, in uh, child care um, is clearly a subsidy for um, increased demand for labor, right? And more children will go into formal or market-based health care um, and out of informal. You know, so if a, a parent takes care of the child or a grandparent or, or a friend, that's informal. Maybe it's not market-based. No, obviously, there's no normative implication uh, there. It's just, you know, sort of just the, the term of art. Um, so it's clearly an increase in labor demand. Now, the labor market is already pretty tight, right? We see that, right? Wages are rising quite strongly, and, infl and prices are rising, you know, even more strongly, right? So real wages are declining, as opposed to before the pandemic, when the labor market was strong, wages were rising, especially at the bottom, and inflation was low, right? So it's just it's a different situation after the pandemic, and the labor supply balance, the balance between labor supply and labor demand, looks like an important part of it. Okay, so childcare. Right, so I already said this is going to be an increment to labor demand, right? Where child care centers are need, need, will need to hire more people, right? Now, what's going to happen to labor supply? So if the subsidy leads people who are in informal, providing informal child care to go back to work, which I think is the intent of the policy, well, that would improve labor supply, right? So if there's a, a parent, and it's, generally, it's going to be generally mom, so I'll say mom just to you know, not have to keep saying parent. Um, uh, who, so just when there's a subsidy available, then goes, you know, enters the formal labor, labor market. And obviously, before the pandemic, I would have said something like, oh, it works out of the house or in the house, and that's so inept, obviously, after the pandemic. Um, but that would be an increase in labor supply, right? Or, or if a grandparent or a friend is caring for a child, and now the child goes into formal daycare, market daycare, and then whoever was the informal child get a child provider goes into you know, works, but that's an increase in labor supply. And I think that's the intent of the policy, and it's just an open question, right? What's the balance between labor demand and labor supply? And again, I'm not, you know, Blackboard here, I'm not gonna sh start shifting curves around and give everyone nightmares from like Econ 101, but um, that's the kind of thing we have to, um, you know, we have to figure out. There's, there's, there's a, a really interesting paper by, um, by a, a woman who's a, finishing her PhD at Harvard Business School that does the same thing with elder care and finds that there's really quite a large response. That again, it's daughters, I mean, just that's, that's what she finds. Daughters caring for par elderly parents, that when there are more programs available, that there's quite a large response of daughters re-entering labor. 
Um, uh, so, um, yeah, and that obviously is the intent of the policy. We have to figure it out. This is, that's, that's what we're going to look at. So, it's, so what's the lesson? Again, the, um, at the beginning of the pandemic, the sort of concerns about incentives and labor supply, I think we're quite far behind on concerns about just get the money out and support the economy, which was plummeting. And now policymakers are thinking, I think, quite carefully about these issues uh, on the